Good evening. Good evening. My name is John Hodgman. As you can see, I'm being constantly followed by cameras wherever I go. <laughs> because as you know, I'm a very famous minor television personality. <laughs> but I am not just that. As mentioned some time ago, I wrote a compendium of complete world knowledge entitled The Areas of My Expertise. <laughs> Some people were dubious. Skeptics asked, how could complete world knowledge be contained within a single book only 236 pages long? <laughs> and the answer is simple. I was lying. <laughs> I was lying. Of course there's more complete world knowledge. There's new world knowledge being generated every day as we live. And as it is being generated, I am learning it. And when I don't have time to learn it, I make it up. <laughs> and so I returned last year with a new book entitled More Information Than You Require. Here is the hardcover edition of the book. Very hard, very hard. <laughs> the paperback edition of the book, as you can see, is much floppier. It's for people who hate permanence. <laughs> and this is just simply a second compendium of complete world knowledge, now extra complete, on subjects as diverse as the past as there is always more of it. <laughs> the future, as there apparently is still some left. <laughs> the secrets of Hollywood, the presidents of the United States of America, gambling, the sport of the asthmatic man. <laughs> the mole men in their capital, Mole Man, Sylvania, how to cook an owl, how to meet space aliens, how to buy a computer from a street vendor, and most other subjects. It's really everything you could possibly want to know about, except for sports, because I don't know anything about it. <laughs> um, but tonight, before we begin uh, the little mutual interrogation that's going to happen here, uh, I'm actually going to read to you from my previous book of complete world knowledge entitled The Areas of My Expertise. I have a copy uh, right here. You will see it's a different color scheme, also flexible much more easily destroyed than the hardcover. Um, because it would seem that I am in that great city that you would have me believe is Chicago. <laughs> I live in New York City. And yet I am surprised almost every day by the number of people in New York City who want to talk to me about Chicago all the time. <laughs> These people tell me that they once passed near or through Chicago, and some claim even to be living there, even as we speak. This is strange enough. But what really surprises me is how many of these self-appointed Chicago experts seem to really believe that Chicago actually exists. <laughs> not, not as an idea or a metaphor or as an allegory. They really believe that there is an actual city standing there in all its legendary, green-rivered, fire-prone glory. <laughs> and that once every 100 years, when it rises out of Lake Michigan, you can even visit it. <laughs> now, look, I understand why this silly concept of Chicago is so alluring. It has been sung to us like a lullaby by our culture and story and song for as nearly as long as there has been an Illinois. Most. <laughs> Most of the novels of Charles Dickens were set in a fictional Chicago. <laughs> so vividly realized in prose that it really did seem real. Who can forget, after all, Fagin's immortal line from Oliver Twist when instructing that eponymous orphan on the pickpocket's code, they pull a knife, you pull a gun. <laughs> he sends one of yours to the hospital, you send one of his to the morgue. That's the Chicago way. <laughs> For many years, Hugh Hefner presented Chicago as his snowy, rainy pleasure dome before revealing his true location in Los Angeles, living in a hyperbaric tube. <laughs> and most recently, the musical Chicago was adapted to great acclaim for the screen under the title Uncle Buck. <laughs> Undoubtedly, there is something in us that somehow needs Chicago as an idea, a dream as fanciful as the notion of an elevated train, which is impossible, obviously. <laughs> but when you attempt to bring the train to ground, to put it on a map and say, this actually exists, it is not merely insane, it threatens to make what is magical merely mundane. 
So perhaps it would be wise to point out at this juncture what we know about Chicago. The fables, of course, are numerous and varied. First, depending on whom you believe, Chicago first appeared to either American soldiers stationed at Fort Dearborn or to a Haitian fur trapper named Jean-Baptiste Point du Sable. It was in 1772 when du Sable supposedly saw the city first rise out of the lake <laughs> and named it Ishikagu and founded a fur trading settlement there right in the shadow of the Sears Tower. <laughs> Second, in 1892, word spread of a fantastic Colombian exhibition, <laughs> exposition, excuse me, to be held in Chicago, a glowing white city within a city, built in anticipation of the glorious 20th century to come, a carefree future of civic corruption, gang rule, and innovative public housing. <laughs> 27 million people, a quarter of the population of America, left their homes to visit the Colombian Exposition, and none of them were ever heard from again. <laughs> Still, the exposition provoked so much heated discussion that New York Sun editor Charles Dana legendarily dubbed Chicago the Windy City, which of course is a misremembering of Dana's original wording, which was Blowtown. <laughs> but in reality, we know that the New York Sun did not even start publishing until 2002, and one wonders now if Mr. Dana even ever existed. <laughs> then in 1900, it is said that the Chicago River actually reversed direction. Some accounts say that this was followed by a hailstorm of snakes and the river turned blood red in honor of St. Patrick. In any case, I say creepy and improbable, which by the way is the name of my new reality television program, <laughs> Creepy and Improbable, about human oddities and unusual stunts, each week featuring clips of me having dinner with a man sporting a beard of bees. Watch for it on AMC. <laughs> Fourth, the poet and explorer Carl Sandburg asserted in his poem, Chicago, that the city was populated by half-naked, white-toothed, magnetic dogmen who had enormous shoulders. <laughs> at, at first, it was believed that Sandburg was simply a dope fiend. <laughs> Later, it would be learned that he was, in fact, speaking of Omaha, and also he didn't exist either. Time and again, the Chicago is real theory simply does not stand up to scrutiny. There are no man-eating vines on the wall of Wrigley Field, no Al Capone, no Ren Weschler, no Chicago Humanities Festival. <laughs> These are stories invented to frighten children. But it is not to say that there are not Chicagoans. I would suggest merely that they are a nomadic people, a diaspora whose lost home exists only in their adult minds and in the glowing crystal memory cells they all carry in the palms of their hands. A great idea of a second city, lit with life and love, reasonable drink prices at cool bars, stable rents, and of course, blocks and blocks of bright and devastating fire. Thanks very much for your kind attention. So, excuse me for a moment. Now I'm going to demonstrate to you the technology we will use for the mutual interrogation. Let's see if this works. Are you still able to hear me? <laughs> it's not magic. Relax. It's not witchcraft. It's the magic of the lavalier microphone. Here, is, here it is. This little box transmits my voice to your ears <laughs> using magic. The difference, of course, between speaking over here this is a lecture, right? <laughs> this is motivational speaking. <laughs> and, and very soon after listening to Ren and I speak, and I guess we're going to watch a little movie, uh, your lives will be much better, <laughs> instead of terrible like they are now. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, uh, Ren Weschler.
Oh. I don't even want you drinking out of mine. <laughs> thank you, thank you. Bachelor Hodgman. Yes. Around the office, some of us were talking about the, 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 the way in which you just, what's the word? Pullulate with authority. You, 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 you just seem to radiate it. It seems to shed off of you like dandruff. A lot of that is the three-piece corduroy suit, I have the, to the, say. That's partly that. <laughs> but, but we were trying to think of, you know, I wanted to talk to you about the wellsprings, the, the miasma out of which that authority radiates. And, and we thought we'd begin by showing a short film which we put together today on, um, from YouTube. Great. Uh, do you know about YouTube? Have you heard of that? Yes, I invented it. Yeah, okay, right. <laughs> Along well, with the rest of the internet. Well, th <laughs> this may explain the sense we had of like a scavenger hunt, finding all the wellsprings there on the internet, which, uh, on the internet and the YouTube which you invented. Uh, but, so we thought we'd show a little four minute film. I, I must say, by the way, this was put together by Matt Heinrich, one of our staff people. And by the way, one thing I would like to say is we're getting to the middle of the festival, but the staff of, of the Humanities Festival put this thing together and they've done a remarkable job and they deserve a round of applause. But to give you an idea of, of the seat of the pads operation we run, I thought I would just show you. You can watch it here. They can see it over our shoulders. Some, okay. some, some other examples of great authorities that, that you seem to draw on. The Chicken Sisters, Miss Broiler, Miss Fryer, Miss Roaster, Miss Caponette, Miss Stewart, and Old Madam Hen. But we're spotlighting Miss Roaster of the Year, measuring in at 14, 15, 14. We're roasting Miss Chicken today on The French Chef. What could an intelligent, human, open-minded man do in mid-16th century Europe? Keep quiet. The wars of religion evoked a figure new to European civilization, although familiar in the great ages of China, the intellectual recluse. Now, there's several different ways of making evergreens. So I'll just show you some. Start by just tapping. Now we use just the corner of the brush. And see? Just back and forth using the same corner of the brush. Back and forth, back and forth. Uh. Delicate little toes of spotting roots, and round her naked, vulnerable body, to shield her against Apollo, is growing bark. Her father is turning her into a laurel tree. Back and forth, back and forth. Leave some limbs out there. You need places for the little birds to sit. At the present time, it is of paramount importance that the women and girls of our country be given training so that they may do their share in the war emergency. So, mashed potatoes, we're back again. Uh -huh. um, the potatoes have been boiled. Here, I've never done it with a machine. Yeah, that, well, it's easy. So, how do you do it with a... Yeah, we in the hood. We like... Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> Good evening. The world has never known a day quite like today. It faced the considerable uncertainties and dangers of the worst nuclear power plant accident of the atomic age. And the horror tonight is that it could get much worse. <laughs> However... You do not like green eggs and ham. I do not like them. Sam, I am. It's the story of Apollo and Daphne. Apollo, the sun god, who fell passionately in love with Daphne, the water nymph, and she did not love him. I am very glad to be able to express my friendly feelings towards the American nation. Why did Daphne flee? Was she afraid of sex? Or was she afraid of this particular man? I will not eat them in a house. I do not like them with a mouth. I do not like them here or there. I do not like them anywhere. I do not like green eggs and ham. 
How about a last minute dinner party for 300 people? What about an omelet? Voila! The omelet show! Arthur, having consulted his closest knights, decided that they should separate and search for the grail individually. Now this is what they did. The, the video stylings of Mr. Matt Heinrich. Here, here. <laughs> now, thank thank you, Matt, for comparing me to Mussolini. <laughs> I, I appreciate that very much. So we want to get a sense. I mean, and that incredible lifelike uh, Eleanor Roosevelt robot. <laughs> <laughs> so I just wanted to have a conversation with you, a little a short conversation, about the Wellsprings of Authority in general and yours in particular. How did you become, I mean, there, there was a guy a while back who they used to say spoke with an authority that others do not have. But I would say that who's, that's true of you. That? That's true of you too. Um, I forget. But but yeah. but, 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 but you Let's certainly you quickly. certainly speak with a kind of authority that others do not have. Well, I have a lot of practice in uh, being a fraud. <laughs> um, it began when I um, uh, left college and went to New York City. I was going to ask before that, what kind of authority were you in kindergarten, for example? Oh, well, that's where the Mussolini comparison comes in. <laughs> I don't remember kindergarten very well. Um, in fact, I, I don't remember very much until I started dressing like Doctor Who in the seventh grade, <laughs> and carrying around a briefcase and a falcon named Hal. The last part is not true, but the rest, unfortunately, is entirely true. <laughs> Um, I grew up, speaking of Julia Child, in, in, the, in the Boston area in Brookline, Massachusetts, Absolutely. an outcast, as someone who uh, did not understand sports and still doesn't to this day. Did you know her chickens? What's that? All did of you her know ch the, the chicken chickens. sisters? I grew up with them, yeah. <laughs> they lived, you were almost mistaken for what? They lived in Cleveland Circle, not too far from me. <laughs> they, um, they needed to be refrigerated. Uh -huh. uh, that was, so it was awkward to date them. <laughs> But Boston is, a, is an amazing city with an incredible amount of culture, uh, the BSO, the Museum of Fine Arts, the Peabody Museum, great literary traditions, great history. Um, but if you do not like sports, get out. <laughs> they hate you if you do not like sports. I could not have been more of an outcast. And it's not that I don't like them, it's just I don't understand them. I don't, I, to this moment, I do not even know the, the, uh, the rules to football. I don't know what to <laughs> That's the one, the oblong ball, right? The mm -hmm. one shaped like yeah. a foot, obviously. And uh, <laughs> I don't know how it is played. It's just I had an indifference to A gouty sports. foot. What's that? A gouty foot. A gouty foot, yeah. yeah. They should call it gouty football, yeah, <laughs> to differentiate it from soccer. Um, and, uh, and so it, it placed me at a real disadvantage. And, I, and I, so I, you know, I spent my days watching public television and listening to, to public radio and becoming a really weird, eccentric 45-year-old man at the age of, you know, 11 or 12, do you know? <laughs> um, and, you know, the, the influences were already sort of um, flowing into my brain of fake authority at that, at that time. Mm -hmm. I mean, I remember very distinctly there, there was a great um, comedy troupe called Duck's Breath Mystery Theater. Um, and they had a thing on NPR at the time, back when I was a, a, a lonely person, um, no. called Ask Dr. Science. <laughs> and I remember it, it was years later that I realized just how fully I had ripped off these poor men. Because <laughs> <laughs> I just, it's, I remember it to this day, uh, Ask Dr. Science, and someone would write in questions to Dr. Science or they would come up with them. And his tagline was, I'm not a real doctor. I have a bachelor's degree. <laughs> in science. <laughs> um, and, and I remember someone wrote in to say, how did, the, um, how, how did the dinosaurs become extinct? And, uh, and his answer was, um, 
a poor posture. <laughs> and, a, and a whiny, gimme attitude. <laughs> and I, I think almost my entire career in um, literary humor slash accidental comedy can be traced probably to hearing that joke. <laughs> um, and also um, Peter Cook, the British comedian who, who, oh yeah, sure, he certainly deserves a, a single golf clap from one person. <laughs> but if I said Dudley Moore, everyone would applaud. <laughs> I like to anger the ghost of Peter Cook at least once a day. <laughs> Peter Cook, of course, was part of the Beyond the Fringe quartet of um, extremely dry British humorists in the 60s. And he also did sort of a side, which included Dudley Moore, and then he also did a, a side gig just doing comedy with Dudley Moore. Mm -hmm. And of course, they, they had a great routine that I remember from about this time hearing for the first time, and it had a profound effect on me, in which Dudley Moore comes in auditioning uh, to be Tarzan in a movie and Peter Cook is the, is the producer of the movie, and it's instantly clear that he's not uh, suitable for the film because he, he only has one leg. <laughs> and the famous line, of course, that Peter Cook says to him, which is not my favorite, but the famous line is, um, I like the one leg. I have nothing against the one leg. <laughs> do you want to do it? No, no, you go ahead. <laughs> I have nothing against the one leg. The problem is... Neither do you. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> but that, that to me wasn't even the best line. The best line was when he says to Dudley Moore, um, how shall I put this? Because it's, it's, a, it's a, a play on just how polite British people were. Now they're terrible. <laughs> um, but he said, how shall I put this? You're deficient in the leg department <laughs> to the tune of one. <laughs> and Peter Cook, too, you know, had mastered a kind of monologic art of, uh, in, the, in, the, in the guise of his character E.L. Wistie, of just being a deranged person talking uh, with great authority about uh, things that were absolutely absurd. And I, and I loved it as a, as a weird Whovian child, and, um, and I think that it continued throughout my life. But back in high school, did you, did you uh, have a following being the authority that you, that you would become, or that was all hidden under a bushel at the time? Did I have a following? Yeah, I mean, did people, did, did, <laughs> as you do today? Well, cult is a strong word. <laughs> Um, but there were matching jumpsuits involved, for sure. <laughs> and and we, lived, we lived in a bunker. Uh, you know, I think that, that for a long time that was my only experience performing was, I mean, I, I never took it particularly seriously, but I did do some performance in, in high school, you know, in the dr drama club and everything. I played a pirate in the Pirates of Penzance. My role was a pirate. <laughs> A pirate, a not pirate. B pirate. You were the A pirate. I, were, I was A pirate, one of many pirates. Oh, I see. They had to have a lot of pirates um, because there were a lot of kids and not a lot of roles. <laughs> right. um, you know, I didn't start lying for a living until later, you understand. Well, that when you, well, we'll come to that later, but when you became a literary agent, I suppose. Oh, yeah, you that's were, that. I started lying, lying a lot every day. Okay, but let's, let's, stick, let's stick with it. Probably when you went to college, I imagine there was a lot of lying involved with that, even getting into that college. Well, I went to, uh, to Yale University, an accredited college in southern Connecticut. And did, uh, as you know, you the get... headquarters of the secret world government. And how did you get into that? Was that an early stage of the line or that? Or... Uh, well, I, I applied. I applied myself. I was, unlike comedians, um, I was a happy child. I was um, well liked by all my peers and teachers. I don't want to brag, but I took some advanced placement courses. <laughs> in, in what? Oh, in history and in science and um, other subjects of learning. <laughs> English, perhaps. 
I also was part of an alternative program, uh, a school within the school called School Within a School, which was for people who wanted to call themselves in sick uh, <laughs> under the guise of taking responsibility for your own education. The primary difference between the education... You were homeschooled by yourself. I was homeschooled by myself, indeed, <laughs> yes. Um, the primary difference was that we did our learning on really disgusting couches instead of, uh, you know, chairs. And um, we mainly just read uh, 100 Years of Solitude over and over and over again. <laughs> Uh, and, this, and this projected an, an, an amusing enough picture to uh, Yale University to allow me to go. And then um, I really, uh, I went and, and began, I read 100 Years of Solitude again, um, and began uh, reading about literary theory, and uh -oh. began thinking that I would become a literary critic. And I'm talking about hardcore deconstructionism, um, because that's where the money is. <laughs> I was a very foolish person. Um, uh, I, I was telling uh, one of my staff people today, we were talking about theory. And, oh, yeah. Uh, yes, and, 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 and my conviction that it was, was perfectly fine. You know, this is, we're talking about uh, Foucault and Derrida and Deleuze and, right. and all those people. And, and, and I feel that it was perfectly long, as fine as long as it stayed confined to the chimpanzees on the left bank. But, yeah, sure. the, but the minute it crossed the species barrier into American yeah. academic life, it was like the Ebola virus and just kind of yeah. ate up everything. It's a good idea in theory. <laughs> but in practice, um, well, I could not make a fortune in literary theory exactly. But I discovered a few things that got me very excited. And, and one of them was the work of Jorge Luis Borges. Um, who was a, a, a fake authority if there ever was one. Mm -hmm. um, insofar, but I mean, obviously, a brilliant, brilliant writer. This is the Argentine writer, Jorge Luis Borges, a very odd duck, a Whovian of his time, um, basically blind from very early in his, in his life, uh, bookish, consumed encyclopedias from, from birth. In fact, um, did not even realize that, uh, this may be a, a fable, but that's why we tell it. Um, he did not even realize that Spanish was his native language um, because he read in English from very early on mm -hmm. and he didn't appreciate that English was a spoken language. He, and he thought that Spanish was just something that you talked around the house and that no one, and it took him a long time to realize that everyone in his family spoke Spanish first. The other day, at one, some of you may have been at the Jewish jokes uh, thing the other day, but, but I told a story about Borges, which I don't think I've ever told you. Uh, which was told to me by Alistair Reed, Borges' great translator. Right. And Borges told him the following story, that Borges was blind as a bat. He was, this did not keep him from being the national librarian of Argentina. Uh, in the huge it's library. It's a terrible library. <laughs> <laughs> very, poor, very poorly organized. <laughs> I actually went there in 1992. And I, and I was like, you people haven't even heard of the Dewey Decimal System, have you? <laughs> but um, he would come down Books the stairs. Books are just thrown into toaster ovens there. <laughs> Did you ever hear about Helen Keller's plagiarism case? <laughs> no. We'll, we'll get to that in a second. All right, good. But, 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 um, but so this, he told Alistair that he would always come down the stairs. You remember the stairs having been there. Yes. And, and then they get you to the bottom, and then you're at the street corner, and there's this huge avenue, 18 July, mm -hmm. and it's, I mean, it's football field wide, and cars are racing by, and he would stand on the corner being sure, because the taxi stand was on the other side of the street, that he, if he just stood there, he was so famous that somebody would take his arm yeah. and take him across the street, and every day somebody would take his arm, who yeah. would be a He was a national street. treasure. He was a national treasure. Yeah. And what, he told Alistair that one day, somebody took his arm and took him across the street, and when they got to the other side, this person said, Thank you so much, sir. It's so rare nowadays for somebody to take a blind person across the street. <laughs> <laughs> well, he had, I mean, the, the thing about him was there were two things that attracted me to him very much, three really. One was that he, he wrote in, in, a, in a form that was very playful. Um, he, you know, his famous story, 
Uh, Pierre Menard, author of Don Quixote, is about a guy named Pierre Menard who tries to write Don Quixote, not copy Don Quixote, but write it word for word exactly the same again, but on his own. <laughs> Forgetting the original and then writing it again. Um, and he only managed to do about two or three chapters. And the whole thing was written in the form of a fake uh, literary article about this fake author. Uh, he also wrote an, an, an astonishing story called Talan Ukbar Orbis Tertius about, uh, again, is a fake memoir of a fake encyclopedia of an invented world, um, which then conjures uh, objects from this world into reality. Um, and so, so he, he, he was a playful fake authority. He also had a really good sense of humor, and he also never wrote anything longer than about three pages, which I liked a lot, <laughs> both as a reader and as an aspiring writer and lazy person, um, especially once I um, became a, uh, I came to New York and began working on book publishing. I realized that um, the only thing that you could possibly sell was a novel, and I thought, well, at least Borges wrote two paragraph sentences, or two paragraph stories. Maybe I'll someday be able to write a collection of incomplete sentences. <laughs> and I did. <laughs> um, so, so that was, that, that was, fin that so, was a so, fantastic So you were influence. amassing uh, that kind of exam uh, exemplums of what you would want to become someday, and you were also studying, what else did you study? You did theory, anything else at Yale that prepared you for this, this uh, astonishing career? Well, I drank a lot. Mm. <laughs> Um, and I hung when, around. When I went to Santa Cruz, there were yeah. people who were taking credit for serving marijuana sentences. For serving what now? Marijuana sentences. Marijuana they, sentences? They would be sent to jail for six months and they would take, get 30 units of credit. They would do the literature of prison, the sociology of prison. Oh, know, really? Prison memoirs, and they would get all this credit. It was, it was quite wonderful. Yeah, Yale was much more traditional. <laughs> I see, okay. <laughs> So they didn't get we just, you, you did non-credit drinking. We drank punch out of silver chalices and then <laughs> spun them around on our head while wearing tuxedos. I see, okay, right. That's an education. <laughs> um, but, the, but the other thing, and, and uh, the, so then, then I moved to New York City and decided that the What world, did you graduate in, by the way? What's it? Say what it did you graduate in from Yale? Uh, the sub, the your, subject? Your BA. Your, oh, your, it was your, in your, literature. Ah. Huh which is, um, there are two majors, the comparative literature major and the literature major, and I chose the literature major because you only needed to know one other language. <laughs> that was the only difference between the two of them. The comparative literature, you needed to know two languages other than English, and I knew that was impossible. So I just did which, which, which was your other language? It was Spanish, which I, you know, I learned it in order to read, to read Borges. Borges. To read Borges' weird English-inflected Spanish. Um, because he wrote, he wrote, you know, in a syntax that was very weird for, for Spanish because he learned English first as a writer and as a reader. Hmm. Um, and, and yet you emerged from college with just one language with a certain je ne crois pas about you, a certain yes. je ne veux pas. A certain quel air est il. <laughs> a certain que suppressa. <laughs> A certain case of Ross Ross. I had, yes, indeed. And that was my attitude towards life. Well, now, obviously, I'll move to New York. I've got my literature degree. Yes, and uh, the world owes me a living. Now, <laughs> fortune will rush to my door. Um, but it did not happen that way. And instead, I had to get a job as a, a front desk person at a literary agency um, in a beautiful... I chose this, this job because it looked like what a publishing enterprise should look like. It was a platonic ideal that you have in your mind if you romanticize publishing at all, and if you do, I'm very sorry for you. <laughs> um, I had no idea just how anomalous Writer's House on 26th Street was in the world of publishing, which by then was A, already very, very, very corporate, and B, already, you know, enjoying its own funeral every day. <laughs> um, you know, the, it was, the idea was that publishing was dead um, long before I got there, and probably since about 1950. But it was beginning to be true at that it point. It was beginning to stink. But Writer's House was this sort of, um, this beautiful sort of honey trap to uh, people who romanticize publishing because it's this beautiful old brownstone on 26th Street that used to be a private bank for the Astor family and had an enormous walk-in vault in the back room where we would store horrible bad novels. And it was full of wood paneling and ferns and 
dark corners where you could take hungover naps if that was your sort of thing. <laughs> I never did that sort of thing. Um, and, uh, and I went there and I worked and started reading, you know, reading things that came through the transom and beginning to realize how impossible a career as a writer really is. Um, but while I was there, I also read something um, in Harper's Magazine that you wrote about, that w eventually became the book, Mr. Wilson's Cabinet of Wonders. Mm -hmm. And I think the original article was called Inhaling the Spore, yeah. was it? And I don't know if you people know this, um, but it was um, an article about the Museum of Jurassic Technology in Los Angeles, which is a museum um, that uh, imitates, uh, in a sense, um, the, the great old-fashioned kind of natural history museum with dioramas and, um, and, and old-fashioned exhibits, um, but of things of questionable existence. What were some of the... Well, I mean, what, what was fascinating is it began, indeed, and in, in effect, you inhaled a spore reading that article. It, it began oh, with a description. The museum, how many of you have been at the Museum of Jurassic Technology? This yeah, guy. Four, yeah, four or five. These, <laughs> this strange uh, family over well, here. Well, well, all right. <laughs> I, I eventually published it's, this book. I describe this museum. And if you're in Culver City, you, you're walking down the street, there's the pit printing, there's the carpet store, the real estate office, the Museum of Jurassic Technology, the Thai restaurant, the <laughs> Autoloo place. Yeah. Like, like in any strip mall in America. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> and you go and you knock on the door, and eventually you get in, and, 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 and you walk in, and it's dark, and there are various, you know, oak tables and glass vitrines and, the, you know, and so forth. And they just have all your standard, and they have all the institutional accoutrements of authority. This is part of why I'm so interested in talking yeah. to you about authority. Yeah. Um, and, and, and it has the acoustic guide. And there's one vitrine in particular which has, you know, it has, for example, before that, it has its, the traditional antler wall, you know, with your typical uh, moose antler and gazelle antler and human horn. Um, it, it, it has a display of protective auditory mimicry where there's an uh, a iridescent beetle that makes exactly the same sound when threatened that the iridescent pebble next to it makes when at rest. <laughs> and, uh, and, 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 but then it has this, this, this vitrine with a, with a uh, uh, a kind of di diorama of, of the jungle, and, and you pick up the acoustic guide, and it has the, the institutional, the voice of institutional authority. The you, voice of institutional authority, that, yes. That, that just says it was great, you know, that, that what you are looking at is a Cameroonian stink ant, one of the few ants whose scream is audible to the human ear. And these are part of a tribe of industrious ants who forage on the rainforest floor. Uh, Doing, going about their business, except every once in a while, one of them uh, will inhale a spore of a fungus raining down from somewhere in the rainforest floor above. Uh, and if you were at ant eye level at that moment, you would see a look of stupefaction come across the ant, as well you would imagine, because the ant, the spore immediately travels to its brain and takes it over and begins to foment be bizarre behavioral changes. And for the first time in its life, it leaves the rainforest floor and climbs the tendrils of the hanging vines and reaches a certain prescribed height and wastes to die. For indeed, now the fungus is eating all of its entrails and so forth, and it does die. And two weeks later, a horn erupts from its, from its forehead, heavy laden with other with spores which now rain down upon the forest floor for other unsuspecting ants to inhale. Um, and, and you Why he casts a spell, doesn't he? <laughs> and you sit there listening to this and you don't quite know. And this is what you hear. This is the voice of institutional it, it tells authority. You all this. And the important thing is you don't quite know. You don't and, quite know. And by the way, that's completely true. As are human horns. People used to get them all the time. I, as you know. I have to rethink my life now. <laughs> <laughs> but so anyways. I was reading this article about, and there, there, are, there are absurd fictions in the, in the museum mixed with realities that you cannot believe are not fiction, just as that. And as you say, you can't quite know. And that was a very compelling idea for me. And it was a very compelling idea for me not only um, 
not only that you couldn't quite know what in the museum was real, but from afar in New York, not in Los Angeles, it became tempting to me and my good friend Sam Potts, who is my old friend who designed my books and is a mad genius, to speculate that perhaps it was all a Borgesian work of fiction. Well, a lot that, of people, a lot of people thought that, and that in you fact, had con that you had yeah. con conjured this place. Several of the opening reviews of that. Uh, by the way, one of the, my favorite reviews said it was a work of magic realist nonfiction, which was a. Oh, no, that's very good. Yeah. I like that. But but I many it. many other reviews began by saying, by I think it was your review actually. But but I, I, but many other reviews began by saying we didn't believe this was true, uh, but we looked it up in the phone book and it exists. Like I would do 200 pages and I wouldn't have the wit to put yeah. an entry in the phone book. You know, that, 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 yeah. that, 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 that proved from. Well, I remember, I remember, and I remember because I, you know, at the time we had no, uh, no internet. I hadn't invented it yet. Uh, we but this had, is why you invented it, wasn't it? I think yeah, well, I was, so, I was so, yeah, because I was like, um, why just a museum of completely dubious scholarship? Why not a whole internet database of false facts? <laughs> and bogus made-up lies. Um, and that's why I invented the internet. Al Gore takes credit. <laughs> for a while he did, then we had a settlement. I can't disclose the terms of the settlement for his copyright infringement on me, but he has to come over to my house once a week and make dinner. <laughs> and we laugh, and we laugh. Um, but at the time, so, so Sam and I could not determine which would be better, that it were an actual place that existed as you described it, or that it was a fictional place uh, that you had described in compelling terms, and that it was, it was a, kind of, a kind of fiction, much like Pierre Menard, author of Don Quixote. And so we ended up having to call, um, uh, call information, and it was listed, and we called, and Mr. Wilson, the curator, answered, and I asked him if this was Mr. Wilson. And he said, yes. And I said, do you exist? And he said, yes. And I said, thank you very much. And I hung up. And I could not, I felt a real disappointment. Well, well I'll, tell you, I'll tell you a story. About that six months after the, the book yeah. appeared, yeah. Uh, by the way, Wilson, who never breaks irony, to this day, doesn't acknowledge the book ever appeared. And when people ask him, I say, I heard there was a book. <laughs> well, he, like, he doesn't acknowledge your book of it? He doesn't, no, he does, doesn't acknowledge good. it. But one day somebody came to the museum, went through the whole museum, came back to the front desk and found him and said, excuse me, are you either David Wilson or Lawrence Weschler? And David said, I'm David Wilson. And he never said, come on, tell me the truth, did that guy Lawrence Weschler really exist? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> exactly. You could have been Mr. Wilson on the other end of the phone for all <laughs> so I know. Well. You could have set it all up. There you go. And I, I think I still secretly hope that you did. <laughs> I just came from Los Angeles. Um, and you I just flew there. I flew there today. I flew because, you know, I have to be places. I have to get places fast, you know. Um, and, uh, and, I, and I did not go. And I still have not gone. I cannot bring myself to go. People, it's embarrassing, frankly, given <laughs> what an influence it has been on my life because it obviously um, it defined what I do in my books so, com so completely as to be plagiarism uh, of a Helen Keller type level. Can I tell you about Helen Keller's plagiarism? Oh I, yeah, I, I hope I, you I, will because I, I don't know what I'm talking about. <laughs> did folks, she, folks, did, folks, listen to me. Yeah. In 1906, Helen Keller, oh, wait, 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 you didn't know that. Let me just Look, you. that's mine. Oh, sorry. <laughs> um, in 1906, you Helen know what? Keller. I need, a, I need a coaster. Hang on a second. <laughs> this is my my. They tell me this is an audio book, but I don't know what these are for. <laughs> <laughs> you were saying about in, Helen in, Keller. In, in 19 in 1906, Helen Keller was accused of plagiarism. Let me repeat that. Yeah. In 1906, Helen Keller yeah. was accused of plagiarism. And, and if you think about it, actually, it's really amazing uh, because everything in her life had either been read to her or explained like this. Yeah, and, exactly. And, and, and so indeed, when she wrote her autobiography, things that she had experienced were right. experienced verbatim 
And, of course, and, of course. And, and uh, so when the book came out, she was, it was a huge scandal. And, and Mark Twain wrote a wonderful, wonderful letter to her in the midst of, she was devastated by this accusation. Yeah. And he wrote a wonderful letter saying you know, how owlishly idiotic and pathetically stupid was this plagiarism scandal. Yeah. As if a single word anyone has ever uttered wasn't plagiarism. Indeed. That's what part of the point of this. The sad the, thing is Helen Keller never read the letter. <laughs> I don't know. It's a piece of paper, I guess. <laughs> it smells like Mark Twain. <laughs> I guess I'll never know what Mark Twain wanted to say to me. My name oh, is smell Helen again. Keller. Maybe you can tell. <laughs> I heard a really good joke. I, was, I, was, I heard a joke today, speaking of Mark Twain, that was, made me so, it was so good that it made me angry. <laughs> it was one of those jokes that you are angry that you didn't think of it. That, as I say, I just flew from Los Angeles, um, first class, first class all the way, by the way. Because <laughs> my time is important. And, um, and a friend of mine who was in Los Angeles emailed me and a bunch of other friends. She was also leaving Los Angeles today and she said, I had the celebrity sighting that made, you know, that, that trumped every other celebrity sighting ever. Uh, it was Hal Holbrook uh, at, at LAX, at Los Angeles International Airport. And I'm thinking, I got, there's got to be a joke here somewhere. You know, Hal Holbrook was famous for doing his one-man show of Mark Twain. Oh, I don't know. I can't think of anything. I don't have time for this. I'm already on television. What do I care? <laughs> <laughs> and then when I landed here in, in what you call Chicago, uh, one of the other friends wrote back and said, um, the reports of his departure have been greatly exaggerated. <laughs> <laughs> it occurs to me that, you know, we've been nattering on and maybe some of these uh, would you like to natter as well? would, would like to natter as well. I mean, yeah. do you, acknowledge the, the, you, you do acknowledge the existence of Chicago when it's just not Chicago? No, Chicago is a, is a, is a, is a literally an urban legend. Okay, and are, th are these urban legendees, or what are these? Well, the, I don't, these are people from Illinois. I mean, I accept that I'm in Illinois. Well, okay, good, right. And I'm very impressed since I've started coming here to read and, and speak on my books of complete world knowledge, the incredible lifelike city that you guys build <laughs> to try to convince me that this actually exists. But I know that it's not true. I know. I know it's just like the Columbian Exposition. It'll disappear in the rain tomorrow once I'm gone. <laughs> well, let's see if any of them uh, have any questions. It's an you. American Brigadoon. Uh, are there any, any Illinois, Illinois people? There's one right there. Wait, wait till you get the... So I guess we're going to wait until the microphone It arrives. There it is. What do you see in your future? <laughs> <laughs> that's the voice. That's yeah. the voice of institutional authority that's right the, there. That's the voice of doom, I think. <laughs> Um, I, well, uh, let's see, uh, Ann Arbor, Dayton, Winston-Salem, <laughs> uh, the Miami Book Festival, uh, because Miami is America's literary city. <laughs> um, and then I, right now, the, I mean, there, there, I will write a third book of complete world knowledge, and I think by that time I'll have gotten it all. Um, <laughs> But, uh, but that is sort of in a, in a hazy, distant future. The future is unclear. Um, my, my, my prophetic powers, uh, I, I'm, I'm sort of powering them down a little bit, actually, in order to be surprised for once. I don't know. We'll see what happens. Good luck on that. Yeah. Um, what do you know about it, anyway? <laughs> <laughs> Here we have some. Has anyone ever perceived one of your lies as a fact and like asked you about it? No, it's more common that people won't believe the true things that are in the book. Um, and they think that they're hilarious. Um, when I wrote in the first book a list of the nine US presidents who had hooks for hands, <laughs> I mean, you know, you know them all, right? <laughs> Thomas Jefferson invented his own hook and, you know. FDR, FDR had a hook for a hand, but no one ever talked about it or spoke about it. 
because it was shaped like a wheelchair. <laughs> And, and, I, and Martin Van Buren, little Van, um, I said he had a hook for a hand, and that's why they called him Old Kinderhook. And, but, it, but it is true that they called him Old Kinderhook, because he was from Old Kinderhook, New York, which is one of the debated origins of the term OK, that that was a sign of approval on the Old Kinderhook Democratic uh, uh, Club of, of New York, that you would write OK on something if it was ready to go through on, uh, and it was approved by the club. So, you know, people don't believe these things. I was just wondering why you have paid such scant attention to the common grape. Common grape? <laughs> I'm sorry, I didn't, I didn't hear. I, I, why am I paying such scant attention to this side of the room? What was the question? Jesse, what was the question? What? Why you paid such scant attention to the common grape? The I common believe grape. The, the fruit. Is it a fruit? The common, the common grape. The common grape. He feels that the grape has been scanted in your attention. It is true that I, I wrote for a long time for Men's Journal magazine on the subject of uh, food and drink and cheese, which is a kind of food. <laughs> Men's Journal being, of course, the, the magazine of men's everyday lives. It's for men who journal. <laughs> but I never did, I don't even, I have no idea what your question means, sir, but I will, <laughs> I will admit that I never, that I never wrote about wine. I only wrote about non-wine alcohol at some length, but I never did write about wine. It is, that, it, that and sports are really two areas that intimidate me. Uh, sports I'm, in, I'm disinterested in, and wine, you know, I got enough snobs in my life. I don't need to start talking to people who like wine. I don't understand it. Now, I've just caught you in another lie. Why? Because you said you know nothing about sports, and I've seen bored to death. Oh, I see. Yes, you, <laughs> you raised the point of my, my appearance being a fake boxer in the, in the, um, in the television program Bored to Death in which I, I am challenged to a boxing fight. Um, boxing is on that, you know, on that blurry line, you know, between sport and... Um, Existentialism. Insane, drunken exercise. <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, uh, I, I don't mind uh, relatively solitary sports. I also enjoy sports that happen in places where people drink alcohol. Uh, darts and shuffleboard and that sort of thing. Uh, falconry I'm a fan of, obviously. <laughs> you know, the more esoteric sports. I like cricket. I like cricket. I don't know how that's played and I've never watched it, but I admire uh, a sport in which they encourage you to wear sweaters. <laughs> <laughs> where the, where the, uh, <laughs> the emphasis is so obviously not on m motion or, <laughs> or exercise that they actually tell you to bundle up a little. <laughs> because you will get chilly st standing on that field for the nine days it takes to play a game. <laughs> you know, I, I, um, I, like, I like weird things, and I think certainly the idea that, you know, putting on gloves and hitting people in the face for laughs, you know, for diversion, um, is, is, is relatively weird. But, at the end of the day, I was merely a fraud. Do you know what I mean? I had two days of, of actual boxing training. I went through about five asthma inhalers <laughs> to do it. And then... I thought you were going to say you went through five trainers. Yeah, no, 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 no. One very good trainer, five uh, very quick trips through the albuterol forest for me. <laughs> <laughs> and what I was learning was not boxing, but, but perfectly so, the, the art of fake boxing, which is a art unto itself, and um, you know, how to not hit the person in the face but make it look like you are, and where, how to get in front between them and the camera so that you can go like that yeah. and snap your head back, you know, and how to snap your head back. And one of the things about that, that show, which in my favorite memories, is um, it was direct, this particular episode was directed by Paul Feig, 
who is the uh, co-creator of Freaks and Geeks and just an amazing funny guy and he directs a lot of great TV shows and he also had been an actor and would do a lot of his own stunts and he had learned a lot of wrestling moves and all of a sudden in the middle of training I look over and I see Paul being thrown over someone's shoulder onto his back boom, like that onto the ring and I'm like Paul are you okay and he just got up he said yeah yeah I used to do that all the time and he's like and he said I just noticed that this was a wrestling ring instead of a boxing ring uh, and I said, what's the difference? And he said, well, the wrestling ring, basically the whole ring is a drum. So that every time you stamp your feet or throw someone down, it makes this huge noise to create the effect that you're actually doing something to someone else. <laughs> and I love it. It was just built right into the equipment, the phoniness. It's almost like a metaphor of your career. It is, in <laughs> it is indeed, but I don't do my own stunts. <laughs> as, a, as a writer, I bring in a stunt double. <laughs> Do you, are there other, or, oh, back up there, okay. Uh, you probably get this all the time, but uh, I have to ask, do you have a Mac or a PC? Uh, I not only have a Mac, I have several. <laughs> I, uh, I recently redid my kitchen counter in iPhones. <laughs> I recommend it. <laughs> Anybody else? Let's see. Yeah, this, there. this is a related question. Do you ever get booed or heckled by people who run Vista? Do I ever get booed, booed or, or heckled, heckled by, by people who run Vista? Uh, no. I have it easy in almost every way. <laughs> but specifically in this way, that um, people who like uh, Macintosh computers uh, tend to like me. Um, but then people who use other operating systems also come up to me and say, hey, thanks. <laughs> and I, and I, you know, people come up to me and say, thanks for, you know, sticking up for us. <laughs> And I, these people seem to be terribly confused <laughs> about how television goes. <laughs> but I don't correct them. I just take their money and walk on. Any others? There's some in the front. We just don't have microphones. There's a so gentleman right here. here. Yes. Okay. Go, just Jesse. Wait, wait a moment. So there's a microphone running to you as you as we speak. As we speak and you don't. There's a microphone running to you. Where is the real John Hodgman, and what have you done with him? Oh, but I am the real John Hodgman. You know, even, the, even though I am, I mean, there are aspects of my personality that I exaggerate for the purpose of fake trivia. The hard, awful, humiliating truths are all true. Um, the glamorous truths uh, are untrue. Uh, although, you know, that's changing now that I'm a three-piece corduroy suit wearer, famous minor television personality. Um, in the first book, I made a list of the films and television shows that I had cameo appearances in. Um, for example, I played the, uh, the literary agent screaming over and over again, the author is dead at the end of the bar in the Muppet movie. You'll remember that. <laughs> And um, there was a, a Denzel Washington Gene Hackman film called Crimson Tide that was set on a submarine, and I played the submarine's um, chief creative writing counselor. <laughs> and the whole premise was founded on this idea that it was absolutely absurd that I would ever be in a movie or television show of any kind, because look at me, for heaven's sakes, you know. At that time, I was in my mid-30s, as I am now, because I do not age anymore. <laughs> Round-faced and weak-chinned and wall-eyed and overweight. There was no way uh, that I was even going to have a George Plimptonian sort of appearance in a movie or a television show. But then by the time I was writing the second book, I was sitting, thinking about this on the set of the movie Baby Mama. Uh, <laughs> and I'm like, oh, no. It's ha it actually happened. Now it is true. I realized that in a weird way, um, life's strangeness was outpacing the lies that I could tell about it. 
And so I had to really redouble my efforts to come up and restrange life for me and for you, because that's when it's interesting. Sir. The next theme of the Chicago Humanities Fest B. What should the next theme of the Chicago well, Humanities Fest be? Well, it's something festival? about laughter this year. What should it be next what, year? What was it last year? Hodgman? I don't remember. Thinking big. Thinking big. The next theme of the Chicago Humanities Festival is going to be... <laughs> <laughs> Obsolete technology. <laughs> you laugh, he actually is the next one, but the, the next one is going to be technology. The, the, the next one is, is the body, and then the one after that is technology. That's the thing. When those things come true, it's very unnerving. <laughs> <laughs> this will be our last question. Okay. Oh, I see. Now he doesn't want to ask it. Oh, it's you just, just a see lot the of look pressure. on his face. He's like, no. Oh. I, I was glad you mentioned the three-piece corduroy suit because I'd like to know where I can get my own. Well, how much money do you have? <laughs> what, are, what are you, about a 42? <laughs> um, honestly, this is a suit that was made for me uh, by tattooed women in Portland, Oregon. <laughs> who I guess got tired of running a coffee house or you know, burlesque studio or whatever they do <laughs> in Portland and decided to dedicate themselves to making fancy suits for men and for women. You know me, I loathe advertising, but I don't mind telling you that um, <laughs> the name of the company is Duchess Clothiers, and they're very, very nice, and their tattoos are wonderful. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, in a few moments, uh, Bachelor Hodgman will be signing books in the in upstairs, but uh, as for now, that is all. Oh, thank you. Thank you.